the, the cardiologist called me. I was in there at like three o'clock in the afternoon and the cardiologist called me at six o'clock and he was like, yeah, you have a major like uh, leak in your aortic valve. <clears throat> and he said, you also have an aortic aneurysm. Hey, welcome back to the Better Fitness Proof Podcast. I'm your host, Matt April, and today I'm very excited because we have another one of our amazing members, Tom. He's here to share his story. So Tom, can you please introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit more about you? Sure. Uh, Tom Gorman, I've uh, been a member since last fall. We joined up in, uh, in November, right before Thanksgiving. Um, I'm a husband, a father, got two teenage boys at home, um, you know, work in the commercial real estate industry. So it's not like I do something in my life that's actually keeping me fit. So that's, <laughs> that's always a, that's always part of the push and pull that we're, we're dealing with here. So, um, yeah. And, uh, let's see what else is relevant. I'm, uh, I'm 50, almost 52 at this point. So, you know, getting, getting to an age where like, you know, fitness is becoming more and more, uh, of a, of a, I think, uh, something you have to be very intentional about as opposed to something that you can take for granted. So, you know, yes. yeah. So, that's good, um, man. Yeah. So I guess that's the, that's the basics. So yeah. what can we do to kick off the show? I always like to start with something that's going to hook people into wanting to hear more about your story. So whether it's a big win that you've recently accomplished for yourself, or maybe in the past few months with your strength, with your conditioning, with your mobility, anything, your health, or maybe it's something that's like, oh my gosh, what happened? Maybe tell me a little piece of your old, your story, and then we'll get to dive into it. So you take it and then we'll, we'll go from there. Yeah. I mean, I think the, uh, you know, the, the 800 pound gorilla for me from a health standpoint, point was, you know, in uh, starting off 2021 with open heart surgery, you know, um, I think that was, that was probably the biggest thing I've ever, ever had to deal with, you know, super scary. You know? So, um, you know, it was one of these things where, and it, it was crazy. It was like something I had no idea was coming for me. Um, in 2020, we were dealing with COVID and just, you know, the usual struggles of trying to keep our boys, uh, focused on, on, you know, not cratering in school, trying to do things remotely and things like that, which for boys with, you know, a lot of energy and, you know, very active, like that was, you know, I'm sure tons of parents can relate was horrible. <laughs> it's just not a fun experience, uh, for them or for the teachers or for us or for anybody really, you know, so we're just dealing with all that stuff. And, uh, I went in, in, um, I think it was like October of 2021. I just had my regular annual checkup scheduled. And it was the kind of thing where I've been super lucky throughout most of my life. Um, I've had some, some minor in injury issues and, and a back injury that we can talk about, you know, um, that's, uh, that I've had to deal with, but those were not like areas where I felt like my, you know, my health, my body just wasn't like, you know, ticking along and doing its thing. I'd always gone in for my physicals and they do the blood work and check everything. And, you know, the doctors, my doctor's always just been kind of like, Hey man, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. You're, <laughs> you're great. You're great. Um, and so we were going through everything and like my blood work was all good and everything's fine. And he's, you know, d doing the listening to my heart and out of nowhere, he was just like, has anybody ever told you, uh, suggested you have a heart murmur? And I was like, no, <laughs> not, a, not a thing. This is a routine checkup. This is just a routine checkup. He's listening with his stethoscope. Uh, and, and he's like, I, he's like, I'm pretty sure I hear a heart murmur. Um, you know, and he's like, I think that's something that we need to get checked out. Like just to be sure, you know, he's like, cause I don't, you know, I'd rather, I'd rather know than not know. Right. So he's, he recommends me to a cardiologist over in Exton. I go over there. Um, the cardiologist, uh, checks me out and like gets me scheduled for, he was like, well, the way we, the way we can really tell, he's like, I think I hear it too. He's like, well, the way that we can really tell what's going on is you have to have an ultrasound. And so like they moved everything like, right along. So literally like, uh, within a day or two is usually like, usually it takes me like now that I'm doing these post follow-ups, it's like, you have to schedule them like three months ahead of time. But like, they got me in like later that day wow. with their ultrasound guy. And like the, the cardiologist called me, I was in there at like three o'clock in the afternoon and the cardiologist called me at six o'clock and he was like, yeah, you have a major like uh, leak in your aortic valve. <clears throat> and he said, you also have an aortic aneurysm. 
So, so. <laughs> so holy, holy cr- yeah. moly. Yes. <laughs> There's so many, so many questions. And I had no clue. <laughs> yeah. So, going into that, what was, when, when the doctor first said that with the stethoscope, the stethoscope and said like, this might be going on. What were the thoughts that were going through your mind at that moment? When the doctor first found it in my physical, I was like, I was like, oh, this is probably one of those things where it's like, he's just being super cautious. I like my doctor a lot. He's caught like some things. He's, he's just, he's, he's a very good GP. Um, he's good at like, you know, catching things at first, like that being <laughs> case in point. Um, you know, but he's like some minor things. Like I had a few years ago, I had this like little, little tiny rash on my side and like, I was like, what, what is going on here? And it was like, wouldn't go away. And it was bugging me and it was kind of painful. And I went in and, and he, he looked at it and he was like, oh, that's, that's shingles. And, and so he got me on some prednisone and it was gone. Wow. Right. Um, and then I realized I'd actually had shingles once before, which by the way, so now for folks over 50, I got the shingles, shingles vaccine, which was very unfun. <laughs> so the second dose I was, I came in, I came in, I told Alicia, you know, the, even like a couple days later, I was still feeling pretty lousy. And I was like, the shingles vaccine was better than shingles. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of a better than shingles. But hopefully if it, you know, if it means that I, I never get it again, then, uh, then that's good. But like I had a minor case and he, he, he's just a number of things like that. He's like, he's always picked them up and been able to diagnose them correctly and, and keep me on track just for little things that have come up here and there. But so, but I was like, oh, this is probably just like a, a little thing you know, whatever. Um, it wasn't until I was in the ultrasound and like, you could just, it's one of those things where you can just like the, the technicians try to be like super neutral and they won't tell you anything cause they're not the doctor. Mm-hmm. Right. But like he kept like, you know, and they always, they always like make recordings of the sounds and things like that. There was like a couple of spots with where I cut, like he was just like taking sample after sample, after sample, after sample. And I'm mm-hmm. like, he's hearing something that's not right. <laughs> and this is the follow up at three o'clock. This, this was the, this was the ultrasound. The ultrasound. Yeah, okay. While so the ultrasound technician you saw your was regular working, doctor. I just got a feeling like, as he was doing it, I'm like, he's really paying a lot of attention to this one thing. Like, it just seems like something's not right. And then my, my cardio, the cardiologist calls me back and he said, he was like, look, you've got, you've got this aneurysm. He's like, you've got a major, they call it regurgitation where it's like, the blood, because the valve isn't functioning correctly, the blood goes through when the heart pumps, but then when the heart opens back up, a lot of the blood just sucks backwards, wow. right? And as a result, my heart was about like 40% larger in the one chamber, the one you know, in, in the atrial, or the, ventric, the ventricle. Okay. Uh, it was about 40% larger than wow. it should be, uh, which is a process of it like expanding to adjust to getting the right amount of blood flowing through my body, even though like probably, you know, 60% of it was coming backwards into the heart every beat. Right. Mm-hmm. So it was a, it was a kind of a scary thing, you know? And, he's like, and so he, he called me up like that night and he was, he was just like, you're going to have to have uh, heart surgery to fix this. It's the only fix. And he was like, and we're going to, we're going to do it right away. So that was like <clears throat> October, early, like late October, early November at that point somewhere in that range. And so then I started the process of, of meeting with, uh, with heart surgeons, you know, which fortunately here in Philadelphia, we have some phenomenal options. Um, so I'm, you know, my, my GP is mainline health. And so I, my, my cardiologist was mainline health. So they referred me to a guy who is, uh, an, ext- an extremely good surgeon at mainline health, um, and talk to him. And I'm sure he would have been an excellent option, but it turns out like over at Penn, there's a guy who like his thing was my problem. It was like aortic valve issues specifically. And he has a really strong track record of being able to normal, the normal procedure is they remove your valve and you have an artificial valve. Right. And if you can avoid that, it's much, much better because with an artificial valve, that means like every six to 12 years, it's going to wear out and you have to have it replaced Place, again and yeah. again. Right. And so at, at my age, a little younger on the younger end for people having valve replacements, you know, they were like, you could end up having like four or five more surgeries, like heart surgeries, you know? So, you know, with that, with that process. So there's this guy, Joe Bavaria at Penn. Um, and he, I'm blanking on his name, but there was the Eagles player who had to have the exact same, the guy who was the long snapper. 
um, I forget, uh, Dorn Boss, uh, okay. who's also the magician guy. If you follow the Eagles at all, he was, <laughs> no, cool. he was on America's Got Talent for, for he's a, he's does magic stuff. But anyway, the long snapper does magic stuff. He was he was always into magic tricks. Wow. Yeah, like sleight of hand stuff. Like he's like ultra ultra coordinated guy. Like he would do tricks, you know, where he'd like snap a football from like forty feet away into a mailbox, stuff what? like that. Like, and so I guess with that coordination, he was also super good at like card tricks and sleight of hand things and stuff. So, <laughs> That's so cool. but anyway, so John Dorenbos um, got one one year was like at training camp, and they literally came and pulled him out because of the results of his physical. They were like, "Don't lift another weight, don't do another thing, like get to the hospital." And this same guy operated on same exact surgery on John Dorenbos. And so he was able to go in and eight hours of open heart surgery later, <laughs> he, eight hours. he literally, he was able to replace the part of my aorta where I had a, an aneurysm, um, and then repair my, uh, my aortic, um, valve that was, that was leaking and get it back. So that it was like, so hopefully I should be good for a long time long, long time, you know, without any other heart surgeries. It's not a hundred percent definite that I'll never have to have anything fixed again, yeah. you know, cause they never are after, when you get to that point. But yeah, so that was, uh, that was my, f- the very beginning. Like I, I actually scheduled with him. He, he had, he, he saw me and it was the same thing. He was like, you've got to get into surgery like as fast as possible. Like we don't want to let this go because it's an aortic aneurysm. Like he's like, if that goes, you're, that's it. Yeah. Like you've got like literally a minute. <laughs> wow. So no wonder they were so fast about it. Yeah. With that, like if you have an aortic aneurysm burst, then you, you, you don't have like very long. Cause that's like a garden hose size artery in your body where all your, you know, it's, I don't want to get gory, but, Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that would, that would be it. So I went in, uh, I was his very first surgery of the year on 2021. Like I went in there morning and I drove down at like five o'clock in the morning on January 4th, which was like the Monday after new year's. And, uh, and then I spent the next, um, 10 days at, at Penn in the hospital. So, wow. yeah. And so it was, it was kind of crazy. And then the, the, from the surgery, I ended up, you know, they, it's a common thing that happens because they're operating near your aortic valve, which is where the nerve that connects your atrium and your ventricles that keeps your heart beating in sync. That ner- that nerve runs right through your aorta. Right. And so that was severed as it often happens in that, in the surgery. And, uh, and so then I ended up, you know, after about five days, they determined that like that had definitely been severed and there was no like communication between the top and the bottom of my heart. So now I also have a pacemaker that we've talked about. You yeah. know? So, um, that keeps the top and the bottom, like talking to each other. <laughs> so, <laughs> Man, Tom, and the craziest yeah. part is, you know, like seeing you in here now like we know this story i knew like the short of the story this is a much more in-depth version of it and i and i'm i'm so so fascinated and also impressed by what you're able to do and how much you challenge yourself and what you've overcome already and knowing in the short amount of time we've known each other what you're doing in terms of your fitness and i know coming in here there were also other like challenges and things you were coming through but as of right now, I know Alicia brags about you every so often, every few, every few recessions. She's like, man, you should have seen Tom today going through whatever it was. And I'm like, yes, like, well, yes, this dude. I love Alicia because she pushes me all the time. Right. And, and she does it in, in a very conscientious way because she understands some of the things I have to be careful about with you know, really, uh, you know, in terms of pushing myself on how much, how much weight they want me to take it easy, you know, from the, the medical standpoint, because they're like, well, we didn't replace your entire aorta, just the part where the aneurysm was. And we don't know, like the rest of it might also be, cause it was a, it turns out it was, a, it was a congenital heart defect yeah. basically. Um, right. so I was just, it was from birth, you know? Mm. Um, and they're like, there may be the possibility of more if you over, you know, if you constantly stress it, that you could get another aortic aneurysm. Right. And so they're just like, be careful, you know, and I'll see that coming a mile away just because they have me come in for the rest of my life. I would have an ultrasound every single year documenting every, you know, millimeter of my heart. That's what, <laughs> so, you know, because of the, because of the surgery, they got to watch everything. So, um, so, you know, there, we got to watch that kind of stuff, but, um, I think we're, you know, we try to push it at the same time being careful. Yeah. You know, she's always asking me like, you know, how did that feel? Like, you know, it's, it's cause it's, you just want to spike your blood pressure again and again and again and again. That's the thing I have to avoid. So, yeah. um, but yeah, it's been, it's, it's been a, a process, 
you know? And so, I mean, th that, that was inspiring enough. We could probably end the show now and it'd be great. Like everyone's like, wow, yeah, round of applause for Tom. Like, this is amazing. I'm still standing. But you're, so. yeah, you're still here. You're still moving forward. But I know that when we first sat down, there were a few other things that were on the list of like, we need to be mindful about it. We need to make sure that we're moving forward to help you get back into being able to get into running confidently and knowing that you can go through the things that you enjoy doing with your health and with your movement, with yeah. having two yeah. teenager, teenage boys, teenage boys who are active too. Like, so, yep. so tell me that well, the, you have some time. the boys are a big part of it. I mean, uh, one side of it that I'll, I'll try not to get uh, completely emotional, but you know the the surgery obviously was was uh, for me it was pretty terrifying <laughs> to have to to have to face that, um, and uh, you know so like the 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 night before I went to the hospital I wrote them both a letter just in, you know just in case because it was like one of those things where it's like I've I've never gone through anything where it was like you know there's a possibility like you know with what they have to do that, that that's it you know so you know I, I wrote them both a letter thank god uh you know it turns out it was just a nice letter from dad now so <laughs> oh, yeah. i'm back but did you get the, to read it with them uh i didn't i left it like, they read it while i was in the hospital because i was i was there for 10 days mm -hmm. so you know i left them the, the letters and they they read those while i was you know i think basically in surgery the next day okay so they did um, read it. you know so oh yeah they read them okay. yeah yeah they and they you know it was uh um Anyway, it, but so, you know, when I got, I think the thing I didn't really quite understand is how much that would set me back in terms of my physical capabilities, um, coming out of the surgery. You know, I thought it was like, they, you know, they were telling, I think they deliberately kind of just gloss over the recovery side of things beforehand so that you don't, cause I think they'd have people probably just being like, I'll take my chances. No, yeah. never mind. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> you know? right. Um, you know, and they said, well, you know, it's, it's a three month recovery for your sternum to be fully healed and like this and that. But generally they're like, you know, in, in 90 days you'll, you'll be back to work. You'll be, you'll be good to go. You can, you can start running again. You can do everything. You'll be fine. Right. Um, but they don't, they don't tell you the, like, you know, f between the, the impact of the surgery itself and then the three months afterwards where you're, you know, like for a couple of months of that, you're, I was barely mobile. Like, you know, like if I could go get up and, uh, take a walk around the block with Maureen, you know, that was strenuous at the mm -hmm. time, you know? And so it was a, a long frustrating, um, process of just trying to recover some of my health. And like, as you're going through it, they keep telling me like, you know, look, Oh no, everything's fine. Like the surgery was very successful you know, you can do anything, you know, blah, 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 all this stuff. And I'm just like, yeah, but I can't do everything. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm so far away from what I felt like I was capable of doing, you know, right before the surgery, right before I found out I, I had a bad heart, you know, like that I, I do a thing on my birthday every year and that was the year I turned 50. So I bike my, my age on my birthday. Right. So, so your age, bike your age of what I, I bike 50 uh, that year. I biked 50 miles miles oh, on, wow. August, okay. on August 5th you know, or right, right around August 5th for my birthday. And, you know, then a couple months later I go in and find out that I have, you know, this major heart issue. Like, and like, like I said, I had no clue. Like I didn't really feel like it was a strength, like biking 50 miles is something I do. You know? mm -hmm. So, um, but I just couldn't, I felt like I couldn't do anything. I couldn't run, um, couldn't bike. I was extremely weak. Like I just couldn't, you know, and so I spent that summer really trying to get, you know, going to the gym, trying to bike, trying to walk a lot, trying to start running again, just, you know, see if I could do it. And it was, the running in particular is, has been super frustrating. Um, you know, where it was like, I'd, I'd run for a quarter of a mile and I'd have to stop and walk for a quarter of a mile mm -hmm. and I'd run for another quarter of a mile. And I just, I, I could barely get past a walking pace, you know, on a consistent basis. Um, um, the biking was slow and difficult, you know, just like everything was, you know, <laughs> was, was not what it had ever been before. And my big fear, you know, like what I really didn't want was like, just to not be able to enjoy life with my kids. You know, I just felt like if like, you know, am I kind of like going to just sort of go downhill from here? Like, is this as good as it's now going to get? And I just have to accept it. And like, I'm just not going to be that physically active anymore, you know? Um, and so it was like going through that process that, you know, talking to Dave and Eileen, and, you know, they've always been huge, huge fans of yours, as you know, <laughs> and they've been here for years and I've seen, you know, that how those guys have benefited from coming. And so, you know, I was like, it's time to try something different, <laughs> you know, 
And that's how I ended up sitting across the table from you signing up. <laughs> yes. And you're not doing it alone, right? You're not no, here no. alone. No, no. Maureen, you know, Maureen was like, fine, I'm, I'm in too. You know? Yeah. So we both came and now, of course, we've got, got the boys signed up for the summer program. Yes. Yeah, so. the whole, it's a family affair here. It's, a, it's, it's the, family the Gorman affair. family's all in. <laughs> yes. And I, we love, we're so yeah. grateful. Yeah. It's a great family to have as part of the, the BOB family. Yes. Uh, so you are, I mean, I think we mentioned it here. I think people can kind of surmise from it all, but so you mentioned it, Maureen, who's Maureen? Oh, Maureen is my, my wife of 23 years. Uh, 23 so, years. Yeah, she's my rock. So, yes. And she's doing it all alongside you. She's been there the entire way. Through yep. the surgeries, through the, the recovery process, through the through, figuring out the gym thing. Through everything. Everything. Yep. yep. And just, you know, trying to keep my, uh, my head on straight. Um, keep me from, from, you know, losing my mind in frustration and you know, yeah. just keeping my expectations realistic. Um, you know, just because I've, I've, I always, I've, I like to push myself. I've always, I've always done that, you know, um, you know, years ago, I, you know, as a, as a runner, um, you know, I did a marathon, uh, back in my, uh, excuse me, I was going to say, <laughs> just thinking about the whole things. Um, tell me, talk to me. Yeah. Talk, tell <clears throat> tell no, me. Just thinking about everything Maureen's done for me, you know, it's oh. just been, you know, what so. are the biggest things? What are like the most memorable things? And I'm sure there's so many you can list. Maybe just like TV, just like two or three. I think the biggest thing, you know, for me is just that, like I said, just that she's, you know, she grounds me, you know, I'm always, I'm always, you know, pushing myself, you know, further and further and you know, sorry, give me a second. Sure. <laughs> and, uh, you know, she, she just grounds me and keeps me, it keeps me focused on what's important and how much I, how much I have as opposed to how much, you know, when I'm frustrated on something that's not working, you know, keeping me focused on what, what I've still got, you know, and how, how impressive and how amazing that is in our lives, you know, how much we've got for ourselves, you know, so that's, that's, you know, I, you know, I don't know where I'd be, <laughs> honestly, you know, you can tell there's a lot of emotion with this and, and I, and I, I welcome it and I'm so grateful you're sharing it because I can relate to, I'm always pushing myself, always trying to reach further than I can, always trying to go higher than I can. And Lynn is the one who's there for me and helps keep me grounded to make sure that I'm able to continue to move forward and know that we've done what we've done and we can continue to do what we're doing. And she's, she is, she's that rock. She's the person who keeps me, yeah keeps me there. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, that's, that's been, I, like I said, I don't really know where I'd be without having her part of my life. So, yeah. So I love having her here alongside me. You know, we, I mean, it's a, it's a big thing we talk about now, you know, we'll come home over dinner and was like, you know, how she, you know, she and I are, have different work schedules. And so she ends up working like a lot of morning or working out a lot of mornings. I'm in the, in the evenings and things like that. And so, and a lot of times we're like different days and things like that. So you know, I'm like, how was the workout today? What were you guys doing? Like, you know, what, what did you, you know? And she's like, oh, I did this. I was able to do this with this one, but I hate this exercise, you know, <laughs> all this stuff, you know? And so we, we talk about, so it's, you know, it's a, it's like a thing that we share all the time now, you know, and it's, uh, it's fun, you know? So it makes it, it just makes it more enjoyable to have somebody, you know, that you can just compare notes with and share the journey and, and, you know, that they're, uh, you know, they're doing it too. So, uh, and now the boys, the boys are starting to do it. So, as they get more and more into it, that's, that's kind of fun too. You know, we're always curious about the stuff that they're doing and they're like, you know, they're like, are your workouts the same as ours? Do they do like the, the prep reps and then the A and the B and yeah. the, the B and the C and all this stuff, you know, and we're like, yeah, it's the same thing. You know, like you guys are, you guys are doing, it's the real deal. Just cause your kids doesn't mean you're not getting a real workout, you know? That's so, right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's and with that, that priority with, with everything you you know, the strength and the conditioning and the mobility work and the stability work and everything built into it. So yes, it breaks yeah. down those sections and that's, yeah. Oh, yeah, so for, and, 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 um, before we leave this topic, so working out, not going to actually be here all the time with Maureen, but knowing that you're doing it together, mm -hmm. how has that, what has that been like for you guys as, as a household, as a couple, as a, as a family, what has that been like? Um, I mean, it's just, it's fun, you know, it, it, it's made it so that it's like, you know, I, for me, you know, working out has gone from something that I was starting to dread and be afraid of, uh, even though I had, I've, I've always worked out my whole life, you know, um, but just because of the lack of progress after my surgery and everything, it was becoming something that I just kind of dreaded, you know, because it was just going nowhere uh, and I didn't, didn't know what to do about it, you know, so, and it's turned into something where I've made tons and tons of progress. And so, you know, it's just been a huge I think overall for me personally and for the family, it's been a huge positive, you know, because I feel like just coming, coming here and having something that's structured and I trust it. And I know that like, it's a well thought out workout program and I have 
coaches here who make sure that I'm doing things the right way. I'm not going to get hurt. Uh, cause we talked about, I have, you know, a blown disc in my, my L5. You yeah. Know, we so. like completely <laughs> skimmed over that one. I mean, like, yeah, one. no problem. We're just going to get right to the heart. We're going to skip everything else yeah. that has already I mean, been that issues. one's like small potatoes. Yeah, at this point, really? Yeah. Um, you know, I've had to go through a few cortisone shots and things like that to keep that, uh, working, but you know, got, you know, knock on wood, had, you know, haven't had issues with that, frankly, for, for years. And since I've been working out here, I've had no issues at all, um, which has been great, you know, and I just, you know, I know Alicia is aware of that when she's training me and we, you know, we work on things where I feel like my, like my core stability is, is so much stronger. And it's like, it's exciting now because I'm, I'm looking at it. I've gone from, you know, a year ago at this time, like I was like dreading exercise, you know? to starting to think in terms of like, I might be able to get back in like shape like I was when I was rowing in college. Like at, you know, in, in my mid fifties, I could be like in incredible shape <laughs> you know, yeah. like, because I'm seeing really steady progress every time we have a PR week, you know, it's like they're far enough apart that I'm always like, what did I do the last time? <laughs> pull out. And I, you know, I'll, like I'll do the workouts and then I'll pull out the sheet from before and I'm like, Look at that. Mm-hmm. I did more, mm-hmm. you know, like, except for push-ups for some reason. So <laughs> really push-ups. Yeah, I'm stuck on the push-ups. <laughs> I, 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 have to, we'll have I really want to break 40 push-ups in a minute, but <laughs> <laughs> wow. I haven't, I haven't gotten it. I'm like in the, I like, I think I matched like uh, the last two times I've matched it. So, but like everything else has been steadily progressing. You know, that's really impressive and, though. If we can, yeah. if we don't want to, I don't want to skim over that one either to be able to hit 40 pushups in a minute and then to match that three months well, later, I haven't hit 40 pushups. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> What's Do you remember I the number? To, do you know I the exact like 32 or 33? So to do 32, 30, 30, period pushups mm-hmm. and the way, and then people don't even know this who are watching and listening other than members. We have a specific standard for pushups too. It's not just like pump out as many as you can in whatever depth you can no, do. No, you You're measuring the depth. And you got to come down far enough. And, yeah, yeah. You have some sort of cone or something to like yeah. full, something yeah. there to give you some contact, some feedback. So you're, you're getting actual pushups in. So that's mm-hmm. really impressive, Tom. That's really well, thank you. impressive, so. <laughs> especially as a guy who's over 40, who's gone through what you've gone through to be able to do that. Yeah. This, yeah. This, give me it's, some, man. Don't, don't let, mm, <laughs> thank you. you. Thank you. This is fantastic. Oh gosh. There are so many other things I want to talk about, but I, I, you know, I want to be mindful of, of the story and the journey, what we shared, but you, you hit on something. Oh, I have those same flip flops. I love that brand. <laughs> How do you say that brand? Uh, they're the Olakai. Olakai. Yeah, I have yeah. two of those. I have a brown and black pair and I wear them all the time. They're like my fifth pair. I wear these like all year round. They are fantastic. Lynn wears, Lynn got me on them. She swears by them. And I was like, oh, I guess so. Cause I was using like the, like the cheapy old Navy ones. They were like uh-huh. just regular black. These you can wear for hours all day. Go for yeah. a couple mile walk and be yeah. fine. They're wonderful. Yeah. Not sponsored by them at all, <laughs> but if they want to be sponsored, sure. That's great. We can plug them in there, <laughs> but you hit on something though. You were, you rode in college. I did. Yeah. 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 So tell me about crew. Tell me about that experience. <clears throat> um, yeah. So I, I guess when I was, when I was younger, much younger, I would always, <clears throat> I played a bunch of, a couple of sports, but mostly baseball. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I had done some track in, in grade school. And when I got to high school, I was like young for my grade. And so like when I got into high school, I was like about 120 pounds. I was like five foot two. Um, I hadn't grown yet. You know, I was like still. You're how tall now? I was still, I'm six foot. Six yeah. foot. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So that didn't happen for me. Like that happened basically all in one year. Like I, from freshman year, I went from like five, two to five, four. And then sophomore year, I went from five, four to six foot Whoa. In one year. And then I've been six foot ever since. Um, Whoa. but basically what happened was like, I, you know, I looked into high school sports and like, you know, tried out like cross country. I, I, I didn't even try for baseball at that point. Cause I just knew like I had already gotten to that point where like other kids had like grown much bigger than me a lot faster. And like, I just couldn't throw hard enough. I couldn't, I just couldn't hit hard enough. I was not going to compete at that level anymore. So I kind of let go of baseball, uh, cross country was like, I went to a private boys high school and cross country was one of their sports where they won like state championships every year. I didn't really understand that going in as a 14 year old, but it was like, they're like, I wasn't going to get cut from the team, but I was also never going to (laughs) run in a meet. So, you know, I was just too small and like, I just couldn't, couldn't do it. Um, and so maybe if I'd kept up with it, cause I had no idea like the next year I was going to grow. Yeah. Um, but anyway, long story short, like high school was more, I was a musician as well. So I focused on You're that. a musician. Yeah. So I played the saxophone I played a couple other things sort of, uh, ow. as well, but like, so I was so into, cool. 
cool. I don't just, skip over that. I'm going to interrupt you. I'm going to keep interrupting you. I went all in on, on music in, in high school. So. so you played saxophone. Yeah. Yeah. Would you, do you still keep up with it? I haven't that much. Okay. Like I still mess around a little bit, but like I haven't really kept up with like a formal like outlet to like play and practice and have something to practice for and all that kind of stuff. Okay. But, but it was definitely like, it was what I needed in high school because I needed something to do uh, that was constructive. And so, you know, I was in, you know, I, I took, I took, you know, orchestra for a class and then I was in the, you know, the, the pit orchestra for all the school musicals and I was in the jazz ensemble and I was in the marching band and I was in the, the traveling orchestra that would go on the trip every year. I like did, I just did it all like, cause it was, you know, that's what my friend group was all part of that stuff. And so we all just was, we we're all doing it together. And so it was, it was a blast, you know? Um, when I got to college, I did keep up with the music. Um, I went to Loyola down in Baltimore and they had, um, uh, they had a jazz band and jazz group. And so I joined that. Um, and I did that for all four years that I was at Loyola. Um, but I wanted to get back into something physical, like, you know, doing a sport. Right. And I you know by that point I, I just kind of knew like, I'm not bad. Like athletically, I'm like, I'm decent, but I'm not at the level where, especially at the college level, I don't have that, like, you know, timing and like elite level of sort of, you know, precision and things that like for the sports like baseball or lacrosse or basketball or those things that the athletes that compete at that level have, like, it's just not going to hang, you know? So, and I'd been out of sports for four years. And so you don't, you don't go to a college and join one of those programs <laughs> when you've been, you know, out of sports. Um, so, you know, but a friend of mine from high school had rode and was, he was like, Hey, they're having an open tryout for the crew team. Um, because the, the reason they did, it was the one where you could, you could do that because most high schools at the time, this was in 1988, right? So most high schools didn't have a rowing program. And so most of the kids coming in, like had not rowed before. So they knew like you had to find fresh talent every year from in the freshmen. And like, so they had an open, open tryout and I went down and it was pretty good. And what I quickly realized was like, um, it was a line that I got from uh, reading, um, you know, Steve Prefontaine, he was the, the runner. Uh, he was a, he was a college runner out in Oregon. He was okay. kind of famous. He was, he ran, in, I, he, I think he ran like the 5,000 or something like that. Anyway, he was kind of famous cause he was like becoming an elite runner and then he died in a car accident and whatever. But he was, uh, his coach was the guy who started Nike. Um, who was the coach at, uh, at Oregon. Um, I forget, uh, Phil, Phil Knight. Knight. Phil yeah. Knight. Yeah. So Anyway, um, but he had a line that kind of stuck with me. Like, I think the timing of hearing it was pretty good where he was just like, he was like, I'm not the most talented guy out there. Like, you know, and I'm not like, he's like, I just, I win because I realize like, it's like, I'm just willing to take more pain than the other guy. <laughs> he's mm -hmm. like, he might be more talented than me, but if I'm willing to take more pain than him, I'll, I'll beat him. Right. <laughs> and so I realized like, I'm like, crew is one of those sports. <laughs> it's like. Where it was like, I don't have to necessarily be like, you know, super elite so much as like, if the guy in the boat, right, you know, when you're, you're in an eight man boat, if the guy in my seat in that boat over there, if I'm just like, I'll suck up more than he will, I can beat him. <laughs> so, wow. so I rode for four years. <laughs> wow. No yeah. experience rowing. No, no. Went and right it, and it, it takes a, years. I mean, rowing takes a certain amount of like timing and coordination and all that stuff. The big thing is like learning for the, for the people in the boat, like how to become like completely in sync yeah you know because if the boat's not totally in sync you know then you're you, we call it checking each other down or it's like you're you're kind of my motions fighting the next guy's motion and, and like every little tiny you know when you do a race that's uh say 2,000 meters you know that's going to be roughly you know 250 strokes so if like 250 times during the race you're just like little tiny bits of like checking each other down and slowing the boat down that that's how you win or lose yeah you know that and like when you get down to the end if you can actually pull they call it a power 20 when you like actually just really go crazy hard at the very end for 20 strokes to like sprint across the line it's like if you can actually do a power 20 and like suck it up and pull that out of here somewhere you know then you can win you know so oh, and we had you know our crew was small, so we had kind of like mixed success, you know, in terms of there was other schools that we raced against. Like we'd come up to Philly and like, you know, Temple and Drexel uh, in particular had like huge crew teams with like, they were recruited all over the country. So wow. they crushed us every time, <laughs> oh. <laughs> you know? but you know, other schools like St. Joe's or Penn, you know, um, you know, so like my, my senior year in particular, I rode in a, a men's lightweight four because there's just like 
a lot of schools just don't really care about men's lightweight fours. They only, they just want heavyweight eights. What does that mean? So there's two weight classes. You have to be under, uh, under 165. Okay. Uh, was the cutoff. I don't know if that's changed now, but at the time it was 165 to row lightweight. And then if you're over 165, you're just only two classes. You're either lightweight or heavyweight, right? The worst place to be in rowing is to be, uh, you know, somebody who's, you know, where I am like right now, who would be like six foot tall and 180. Mm-hmm. Like, that's no man's land, right? Because the heavyweights, like they stack boats full of guys who are like six foot four, 225, like shaped like a wasp. You know, wow. Just like you know, eight of these clones that they get from all over the country and stick them in a boat and they just go like hell. You know? <laughs> so, so we, uh, the four of us got together and we, and we, uh, told our coach, we were like, we want to row together cause we were all lightweights, but we were all like, we were good lightweights cause we were like 160 to 165. You're like right there. Oh yeah. Know? Yeah. Right. The um, and so we put a boat together and that boat, that was the most successful boat we had. We did pretty well. Uh, we still didn't beat Drexel and <laughs> Temple and some of those big schools. Yeah, they got some monsters, I guess. With huh? big, with big crews, they just had they just, the talent was just too good there. But yeah, we would do pretty well at races like down in down in Baltimore and like against Penn and and St. Joe's and other schools like our size. You know, we did uh, we did pretty well. So that's so cool. That is fun. A, that is a cool piece of your history that will never be forgotten, never be lost, never mm-hmm. be uh, something that just kind of. It wasn't important. This is a big part of your your history that that kind of well, that really got me rear. back on like as a as a back into physical you know f- activity and fitness and like and understanding like what I was capable of and so like that's really like I think coming out of college, it was always I, I always ran after that and kept up with the running because mm-hmm. you know we would do for crew we had practice from. This was another big thing that kept people off the crew team, but we had practice from five to eight in the morning every day. Whoa. Um, cause you'd go out when the water is nice and flat in the morning, mm. um, and before class. And then mm. we had land practice from five to eight at night. And we had two, and there's two seasons. There's the fall, which is the long distance season that goes like into November. And then you have basically December and January off. And then February you start training for the sprint season, which is the spring. So it's kind of never, never ending. <laughs> so. I have no idea. Like crew is a whole new uh, world to me. Like as an adult, as a kid, I didn't even know it existed. Yeah. It was a thing. And you have to want to stick with it too, because it's a sport where it's like, there's no glory. There's no audience. Like you're on a river mm-hmm. or out on a bay or something somewhere. And like, there's no, there's no cheering section. There's no, <laughs> like nobody comes to see you. Nobody even knows you have a race. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> wow. You gotta have really <laughs> mentally strong, uh, for you have to, the fortitude to be able to get through that. Cause there's no one cheering for you. It's being it's part you. of the team and like, you know, basically doing it, you know, being in the boat and doing it for each other. That was the fun part, you know? So like in like Philadelphia is probably one of the best places just if, I don't know if you've ever been down to the river and seen, they do have a little bit of a grandstand at the finish line uh-huh. of the sprint course. Um, you know, so like you go down there and there might be, you know, a hundred people watching or something okay. for, for like, you know, the dad Vils where it's like one of the biggest crew events of the entire year. <laughs> so, um, that's it's like cool. everybody's just everybody's parents basically. You know? Oh, so, that's but cool. But you can come and see the finish, which is the only really exciting part of a crew <laughs> of, a, of a race. So <laughs> the final 20, the 20, the, 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 what, like the, the last 20 strokes there where the yes. boats are like, what know, was it called again? 20? The, what'd you call it? The they, they call it a power 20. Power so 20. So you have a coxswain who steers the boat. Okay. She's kind of like the strategy for the race telling us like basically what to do. And so you know, she'll, she'll decide like at the, you know, when's the spot to like, okay, you know, we're going to call a power 20. And sometimes, sometimes it would be a power 20 where she would call it and she knew it was too early, but we had to get like, we were like gaining on a boat and she wanted to get past it. So she'd call a power 20 and we would do it. And then we would get past that, like a boat. And then she'd be like, okay, we need 10 more. And you're like, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> All that, but go again a little more. It's kind of like a trainer. That's like a personal yeah, trainer would do right, to you. Right. Like, this is the last one. You do she's another like, set. <laughs> she's like, okay, so psych. That wasn't really the end. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That sounds familiar. I think I knew that, that, that line right there she's too. Like, but we're in, you know, like sometimes it would be like, well, if we pass this boat, like we're in third or something like that. And we're in a metal spot. So it's like, you know, yeah. Or like getting to the next heat or whatever the case is. So and I'm yeah. sure that taught you a lot of really, really great life life skills and business skills that have allowed you to be as productive and as as successful as you are in your personal life and your professional life. Sure. And in all of those ways, um, you know, I think Tom, you have an incredible, incredibly inspiring story. And I know that a lot of people who will watch and listen to this, who see you on a regular basis, have no idea. Like members here have no idea what you've overcome and what you're going through and what you have to deal with and what you're able to accomplish now. Well, that's why I like, I watch, I like watching these because everybody's got something, you know, and you never just come into the gym and seeing people and saying hi and working out. Like 
you never know. Yeah. But, you know, I do love like when I come to the classes, I feel like there's always somebody in my class who, if I'm kind of not feeling it or I'm like, I'll do the same thing I did last time. I won't try for like a little bit more or whatever, you know, an extra rep or a little uh, next, the next weight up or something. There's always somebody else who is, you know, and then I'm like, okay, <laughs> now I, now I have to. Yeah. <laughs> so, Cause like, it's that I, ha- I like, yeah, I like that. You know, that's just, even if I'm not, even if I'm not even vocalizing to anybody that like I'm competing with them, I'm just like, well, you know, if you're going to do that, then I'm going to do this. Cause uh, <laughs> I'm not going to be the one who's doing like the second best level of effort <laughs> so, <laughs> in the class. You know? So it's just like the, you know, internal monologue that I have. Going. <laughs> yeah. so, you still got a lot of that competitive edge. Yeah. Um, yeah. I enjoy that, you know, and that's, that's helped a lot. It's really helped a lot. So it's been fun. I mean, you know, the, the other thing that I did recently, which I just like, you know, you know, when I started here, I think I mentioned to you, I was like, we talked about diet and I was like, you know, my weak spot is my love of craft beer. So, <laughs> you know, so um, but like, I, I just decided to quit in January, like maybe not forever, but I was like, I wanted to give it like a good long, long break. Cause I felt like I was like, you know, from the standpoint of a little bit from a little, you know, weight loss and, and things like that, I was like, I feel like I'm kind of like stuck. And mm-hmm. I was like, let's just drop that. Cause I know it's, you know, totally useless from a health standpoint. Mm-hmm. It's totally counterproductive. So I was just like, you know, and I was like, I hit a point, I'd been thinking about it for a while. And then I went to a Phillies game with my brother at the beginning of June and we had a good time, but I had a couple, you know, I had a few beers and the other side of it too, is just like, as you get older, right. It's like, you know, it just feel worse and worse every time you have a few beers. And so that was like a Friday night and I'm like, still on Sunday, I'm like, I still don't feel completely right. Like, right? and I was like, I'm going to do this now. Like, it's just like, it's kind of getting to that point where it's like, it's not really worth it. You know, mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. as much as I like the beer, like the, the day after is just like, mm, you know, so yeah. So I just stopped. <laughs> you know? I think that's awesome. And, and it's like, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, I've always, I've always enjoyed, you know, I've, I've always enjoyed it because I just love the, you know, the interesting flavors and some of the stories and the brewing process. And like, I've always kind of geeked out on that stuff, but you know, I think to the credit to bent on better is I'm at a point where like, you know, the progress I'm making in my fitness is more exciting than, you know, wanting to relax with a beer on a Friday afternoon <laughs> after work, you know? So, Oh man, that's yeah. awesome. Oh, that just made my day. So. Oh, Tom. <laughs> well, look, man, I think this is so inspiring and I want to keep talking, but I don't want to keep you all day. Um, so <laughs> why don't we, why don't we, we're going to kind of bring things to a close here and yeah. I want you to, uh, I like to kind of end on a note, like you've probably seen it before. I like to yeah. end on a note where it's a positive note, but if we can do it as if we're on level, we're on floor one and we just got into an elevator with someone else who's gone through something like something as drastic and as life altering as you've gone through, maybe not necessarily a surgery, like open heart surgery, but mm-hmm. something very close to something like that, where you know their story, but that they're, they're in a place where they're not sure what to do next with their fitness, with their health, with their mindset, with their lifestyle of any sort. But you're in an mm-hmm. elevator, we're on floor number one, and we get to go up to floor 20. So we only have, it's a slow elevator, so we only have about 30 to 60 <laughs> seconds here, okay? So what would you say in those 60 seconds in our elevator ride to this person to help them change their life? I think it's pretty simple for me because my, you know, my weakness in this kind of a thing has always been uh, asking for help. You know, I've always been super independent and I've always been able to like, you know, I pride myself on like figuring things out myself and like, I've always, you know, been pretty, you know, capable of, of figuring out how to get myself into shape for things like running a marathon or, or whatever it was. Um, and so, you know, I just never pictured myself as like, you know, I had friends with personal trainers at different points and things like that. And, you know, I was always just kind of like, uh, I don't know, that just seems like unnecessary, um, but you know, I hit a point where I was like, I'm, I realized like I need help. I'm not going to make it without some help. I need somebody who knows more about this than I do. I need somebody who can, I need to be willing to accept help from somebody, you know? Um, and I feel like, you know, I'll probably as a, it's probably a little bit more of a guy thing, but you know, there's plenty of people out there that have that mindset. I've, I've seen it in a lot of cases at work and in life and things. And so I'd say, you know, if you're one of those people who's just like super independent and whatever, but you're struggling and you're just not making the progress, like get help, like just ask for help. You know, that's the, it's made all the difference for me. That's so. huge. Oh, that was, that was solid. That was solid. That was really good. <laughs> Cause you're right. You identified a specific kind of person that is very, very popular, and especially in the, I think in the male demographic, 
We're like, we want to do everything on our own. We've always been taught from a young age up until however old we are now is that like, especially in school, right? It's, it's like you are tested on just you and your abilities. So you need to study by yourself, do your test by yourself, do everything by yourself. And if you look or ask for help in any way, that is cheating. Cheating. That, That is not allowed. Yes, I've had I've struggled my whole life with that because especially going to like Catholic school my whole life it was like drilled in you know um, you know that was that was one of the things that I look back and I'm just like that wasn't really the right message <laughs> right <laughs> you know because it was drilled into you that like asking for help is cheating mm-hmm. you know and yeah so and uh, you know I, I I tell people that I hire and train and mentor in my career and everything else that I'm just like. The real world don't work that way. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? The real world is like you'll go twice as far, twice as fast if you just ask for help all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, so just do it. You know, so that's why I'm here. That's big, man. That was awesome. We'll wrap it up here. Yeah, sounds good. Awesome. So yeah, for cool. now, if you've been hanging out with us, thanks so much for hanging out with us on YouTube, on Spotify, on Apple, wherever you're listening. Thank you so much. But if you're here on YouTube, make sure you click the subscribe button, give it a thumbs up on this video because Tom's story is amazing. And because we want to keep giving more content like this. And then if you're listening on Spotify or on Apple music or anywhere else, any of those other podcast platforms, go ahead and click the subscribe button or notification button, that little bell. So you can get notifications when future episodes come out. And of course, leave it a five star rating because well, why not? We are, we're here. It's a free show and that's how you can support the show. So for now we're going to wrap it up and we'll say thanks for hanging out with us. Tom, thanks so much for being here, man. I'm going to give it a five star rating. So <laughs> right. that's right. He's going to do it. That's great. Awesome. All right, man. We'll thanks, see you again man. next time. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Bye.